Hello, HDC. It's great being with you this weekend. It's good being here in Victorville. I want to welcome in our Apple Valley, Phelan, and Hesperia campuses today. Uh, it's just a blast being here. I don't know if you watched that bumper video and you're kind of tracking with all the different logos going there. It's kind of interesting how logos connect you to whatever brand they're selling. When I was uh, overseas in Eastern Europe one time with my wife, I was wearing a shirt, and I don't know if you can see that, but it has a, a little O there on it. You might know what that O stands for. If you don't, that's okay. But I'm wearing a shirt with that logo, and I'm in the middle of this Eastern European country, and we had a Starbucks there. My wife wanted to get one of those, what are they called, been there mugs or something like that. Yeah, okay, okay, we'll call it that. So we go into the store, and we're in line, we're getting the little mug, and uh, this guy starts pounding on the window, and I'm like, uh, this could be an attack, I wasn't sure what was happening. And he simply started yelling, go ducks, for the Oregon Ducks, which is the team I kind of rooted for. And it was funny because we're halfway across the world and this guy is pounding and he comes in the store and we just sit down and have a conversation, never met the dude before in my life. And we had a conversation about something that I was wearing on my shirt that connected us. And I think it's interesting because when we come to brands that are pretty powerful, but our HDC brand really isn't about logos. It's not about mottos or buildings or programs. Our brand is what makes us tick. It's our purpose and our values. It's how and why we do what we do for the kingdom of God. And last week, and Pastor Todd started us on this conversation of being on brand by sharing our purpose statement, which is preparing every generation to change their worlds for Christ. That is what holds us together. And he reminded us, and I love this, he said our purpose and value serve as guardrails to keep us from drifting to the right or to the left. And today we're gonna to continue our series on brand and look at the first of our core values. If you have your notes, you can follow along. And core values are basically the fundamental guiding principles or beliefs of a person or organization. They determine how you do life, how goals are set, and they determine how you actually relate to your world. Core values are those traits or qualities that are not just useful, but they represent an individual or an organization's highest priorities, deeply held convictions, and strongest motivations. And believe it or not, everyone in any of our rooms today has a set of core values. It's just that you probably haven't articulated those to anyone. But if someone spends enough time with you, they will begin to understand what drives your decisions. What are your values that control your behavior? And churches have them too. There are lots of God-honoring churches here in our valley that do a great job serving Christ in the kingdom, and we share some of the same values with them. But if you spend enough time with any church, HDC included, you're gonna discover some values that uniquely shape how we impact the kingdom of God for his glory. And so today we're gonna to unpack our first church core value, and that is the value of being truthful. If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to the Gospel of John chapter 14. We're gonna jump in there fairly soon, but you can just put your finger there while we get things set up. If you ask someone today in your world, what is truth? I'm guessing you'll have some very interesting answers and opinions. It's the question that actually we find in scripture. Pilate, at the, at the trial of Jesus Christ, asked Jesus, what is truth? Almost dismissing it as a reality, but that is why we start, because truth has consequences. It matters what we believe, because knowing what is actually true will influence your choices and in turn, shape your future. So what is truth? Taking a few seconds here just to set the table, but truth is defined, and this is in your notes as well, as that which conforms with fact or reality. Truth is what conforms with fact and reality. It's what the philosophers and theologians call the correspondence theory of truth. It's how things actually are. Now this is great because the Bible has two words for truth. We have the Hebrew word amad and we have the Greek word aletheia. Both of those reflect this essence of definition. Truth is an idea, a belief, or a statement that matches or corresponds with reality. So let me 
Let me explain how this works in a pretty simple way. And you're going, oh, that was simple. So if I hold up this sign here, you're going to say horse. I hope every campus got that. This was not very difficult. <laughs> if you failed on that one, it's going to be a long day. Okay, so that, respond, that reflects reality, right? That is a horse. You're not going to call that a, a bird, okay? If you did, again, that's a different problem. And then that is a clock of some sort. Now, it also, what time is on the clock? About 10.10. I know sometimes in school we don't teach this anymore because everything's digital, but welcome, that's 10.10. Okay, that's two for two. You guys are doing great. Let me go to a third one. It's a hammer. This corresponds with a hammer. And then finally, yeah, Bruno Mars. Now, by just saying that, you're laughing because you know that doesn't reflect reality, correct? This is our senior pastor, Todd Arnett. But this is what correspondence reality of truth means. When you have a truth, it is evident with what is reality. It fits with what is. And that's a very basic and simple example of correspondence theory of truth. But I hope that at least serves as a backdrop. We're gonna come back to that idea a little bit later. The bigger question I want to get to is not just what is truth, but maybe the more important question is where does truth come from? And that's where we're going to jump into God's word. Throughout the Bible, God himself is defined as truth. God is truth. Theologian A.W. Tozer once said, what comes into your minds when you think about God is the most important thing about you. And that is so true. What we think about God actually is the most important thing because it's gonna frame all of our reality. And that's one reason why Jesus Christ, when he came to earth, he decided, I wanna spend a lot of time explaining what is the truth and how it relates to you. In John chapter 14, I'm gonna start reading, you can follow along, but Jesus is talking here. This is shortly before his death. He's in the upper room with his disciples And in verse six, he makes this now relatively famous statement. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Notice first that he did not say, I am teaching the truth or I have access to the truth or I even know the truth. His statement was, I am the truth. He was truth incarnate, truth embodied because that was the nature of God. If we continue on in this passage, starting verse seven, Jesus goes on, he says, if you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip is surprised and perplexed. He says, Lord, show us the father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, verse nine, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Jesus says, I am the truth. And now he says, I and the Father are one. And so if I am the truth, then the Father is the truth. He is equating those realities. Jump down to verse 15. Jesus is talking again. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. There are many other passages in the Bible that we could turn to to explain the fact that God is truth in his essence. But right here in just one chapter, one part of one chapter, we see the triune God being stated as truth in essence. Truth proceeds from God. And while many things could have the truth, and that's true, only one person can be the truth, and that is who we serve and love. Who he is and what he says and what he does defines truth for all time in every generation. That's why Jesus could confidently say in the same book of John, 
If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. If you know the truth, it's not just knowing facts. He's saying if you know the truth, pointing to himself. If you know that truth, it will free your life to live as God intended it. And that offer is still available for every one of us today. But not only is, I'm gonna go now to the next step here, not only has God embodied the truth, but he also gives us the truth in communication. If you turn in your Bibles, just a couple of verses, chapters over to chapter 17 in John. John 17, verse 15 says this, my prayer, this is again Jesus talking, is not that you take them, meaning believers, out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world, even as I am not of it. Verse 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. The Bible is God's written truth. So God is truth, and then the Bible is God's written truth to us as well. That word sanctify them in the truth simply means to to make them holy and useful. Set them aside for this purpose that I have given to them. And his written word is truth. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Apostle Paul is writing. He says this in verse 16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture is God-breathed, that comes from God. So what we have here is breathed out, as it were, from God. And the Bible teaches us what God is like, how God acts, and how God relates to people. In fact, everything written in this Bible relating and concerning to God is consistent with his own character. But beyond that, the Bible doesn't merely contain truths or stories about God. It is, in fact, completely true in everything it teaches and affirms. That's why something cannot be true in religion and false in history. I love archaeology. It's one of those kind of side things I love. And that's one of the things I love is when you have a consistency, you're going to see archaeology is going to prove the Bible true. They're never going to be inconsistent once all the evidence is found. When you have truth, it can't be true in science and false in theology. Truth has to be consistent across the board. And so we serve a God of truth who holds truth together. And that truth that is written here for you and I is super helpful. It's pretty awesome. If you look at that verse there, all scripture is God breathed and is useful. There it is. For what? For teaching. Teaching, this is showing us what path to walk. Then it says, for rebuking. It shows us when we've gotten off the path. If you've read the Bible, you've actually read it sometimes, you're like, oh my goodness, I didn't even realize, but I see how I got off the path that God wants me to walk. It says it's for correcting. It shows us how to get back on the path once we've gotten off the path. And then it's for training in righteousness which shows us how to stay on the path at the first time so we don't get derailed. God's word is pure, it's unchangeable, it's irrevocable. And he wants you and I, this is what's awesome, he wants you and I to know it deeply. Isaiah 45, 19 says this, I have not spoken in secret from somewhere in a land of darkness. I have not said to Jacob's descendants, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, catch this, speak the truth. I declare what is right. I'm fascinated. I'm at home at times and I'm watching something and the medical commercials come on. Anyone enjoy watching those? And you're curious if the disease is worse than the side effects of the medicine. You're going, why would I take that? I mean... You could lose a lung, your left knee will fall off. I mean, it is crazy. You're like, I don't know, maybe it's worth it. But you go down, and then all the time, on the very bottom of the screen, you know, it has that little, that little font, right? Remember, you're like, oh my goodness. I can't believe, it. I don't, and you're looking at it, you're just like, this is absolutely crazy. 
I want to let you know when it comes to God, he does not have fine print. I want you to know that God is not hiding the truth, saying you can't know this, this is only for special people. There is not a fine print in God's reality. God shouts his truth through creation. Read the Psalms, it describes that. He declares his word through his, his truth through his, his word, and then as you and I live in the character and we see God for who he is, he begins to live out through us as well. God is truth, and the Bible is written truth to us and that is a value we hold on to as a church and that is a value we will challenge you as members or attenders at HDC to hold on to as well to cling on to that reality that God is truth himself and he has written truth that is meant to guide our life why does this matter Why does it really matter? You might be saying there, that's great. Yeah, okay, I can buy that. But Kurt, what's the big deal about that? Well, if truth, excuse me, if God is truth, then there is certainty, there is clarity, and there is hope. There is a standard by which we live by that makes sense of this world and we begin to understand how we fit in it. If God is truth and his word is truth, then he also has authority over our lives, and we must submit to that reality. If God is truth, then I have no grounds to claim my own truth in conflict to his. One of my children, when she, that narrows it down to three of the four, when she was about four years old, I think she had watched maybe too much Peter Pan, but she thought she could fly. It was an amazing experience to watch her talk about flying. And I remember one day she went to preschool and she began to test her truth. She climbed up a very, very tall slide that's meant to go sliding and she attempted to fly. We get a call from the school saying, your daughter attempted to fly. (laughs) We picked up our daughter, took her to the hospital The doctor set her leg in the cast, full up to the waist here. And for months, I had the joy of carrying my daughter around. Uh, The benefit is that you get into the front of rides back then at resorts, just to say that, and you don't do that, it's bad. It was the only perk. But it's funny when that happened, that the event was funny, but as we walked through life, we didn't go pick her up and said, you're the worst person ever, I can't believe you tried to fly. We did not take her to the hospital to get her broken leg set. We simply talked to her and said, what was going on? I thought I could fly. I love a four-year-old saying that to us. But you know what we didn't do? We didn't sit her down and say, hey, you know, when your leg heals up, we think you can fly too. And we want you to try it again. See, that's the difference between truth and reality. It would actually be harmful for us as parents to have egged her on with her own truth, using that word in quotes, because the consequences are too great. We live in a society today where people around you think they can fly, spiritually at least, They think they can rewrite what truth is. And so they're in your world and you are engaging them and truth to them is changing, it's evolving, it's under their own interpretation. In fact, the most intolerant thing you and I can probably say is there is one truth and God is truth. To them, that is a deal breaker. And that's one of the reasons why uh, Christianity, church, And maybe you are unpopular with your world at times. I love this quote by G.K. Chesterton. He said this, what we suffer from today is humility in the wrong place. A man was meant to be doubtful about himself but undoubting about the truth. This has been exactly reversed. We are on the road to uh, to producing a race too mentally modest to believe in the multiplication tables. End of quote. This quote is, old, long time ago. But he's on to it. There's something about truth that matters. 
but we're almost afraid to say there is truth. Let's look at these again. When does life begin? What is marriage? What is a man or what is a woman? How can I get to heaven? You see, these last four pictures might seem very difficult to explain nowadays because our society is trying to fly. But I want you to know in God's mind, these aren't hard questions. These are the same difficulty level in answering. Do you understand that? This isn't confusing to God. He's not like shocked that, oh, I don't get this. These are no different to him. It is simply truth. But we live in a society where this somehow is challenging to uphold because another narrative is controlling what's happening. When we don't hold to the truth, doubt begins to creep into our minds. Because God is asking us to live one reality and our society or even maybe inside of our heart is challenging us to live a second reality and we're at conflict with each other. I want to let you know, doubt isn't always bad. Doubt is actually sometimes very helpful because it moves us back to figure out what we believe. There's a lot of stories of doubt in the Bible that basically challenge us. Hey, you don't believe, go back and look at the sources, get the facts. But many people's doubt grows deeper, and maybe yours does too. Maybe you're here in one of our rooms today and you're like, I'm doubting, I get it. It's growing deeper and you're fighting this and it's getting a hold of you. One of the reasons that you doubt and one of the reasons you doubt more and more is that you're listening to the wrong voices. Throughout human history, we have an enemy who has always promoted uh, doubt and pushed back on God. From the very beginning of the Garden of Eden, if you remember what he said to Eve, did God really say? Is that really truth that he gave us back then? And Eve listened to that voice. The means of influencing people has changed over the centuries. How he goes about it, but the basic strategy is the same. Let me walk this through out of Romans 1 and 2. Romans 1.18, talking about humanity, it says this, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all, all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the, tr- uh, suppress the truth by their wickedness. Jump down to 25. They exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever praised, amen. And then in chapter two, verse eight, it says this, but for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. Those words were written 2,000 years ago, but does not reflect reality today? When the truth of God and his word conflicts with someone's own desires or their own truth, the first step is to suppress the truth, to hide it, to act like it doesn't exist, to say it's not that important, and so they suppress it. And if that doesn't work, they begin to elevate their own truth in place of that truth. I don't like what God says, so I'm gonna put my own truth in place of that and my own selfish desires. And if that doesn't solve their problems, the person simply rejects God and his word outright and walks away from anything like even no truth. Suppress the truth leads to exchanging the truth, which leads to rejecting the truth. 
And that is a very dangerous trajectory to be on. And if you're in any one of our rooms today, recognize that it's, if you're in that route and you realize I'm already down this road, know where it's gonna take you. Know the end game. Because the consequences aren't simply breaking a leg, trying to fly in a preschool playground. The consequences of rejecting the truth are eternal. And your friend's rejection of the truth has eternal consequences. I wanna let you re just remind you that the people in your life who are maybe in your face with their own truth, they're not the enemy. Don't ever think they're the enemy. Our enemy is Satan who is selling them lies that they are buying. So when we look at our world and we see the brokenness around it, what do we do with this? Because this isn't just something we believe out there. Oh, I believe God is truth, I believe his word is truth, great, I believe it. No, there's gotta be some action step that we have as believers that relates to a world that is trying to fly but can't. There's three things, we'll wrap up with these three as we close. First, you and I need to love the truth. And we love the truth best by loving God. Deuteronomy 6.5 very famous verse, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. We love God with all that we have and all that we are and as we love him, we begin to love the things he loves. I've been married 34 plus years to my beloved bride and I tell you, as you get older in your marriage, you just grow in your love for that person. And you actually begin to understand what makes them tick and you kind of get on board. Like, and I'm not a fan of them, but I go to garage sales now. That's weird. I actually can justify the amount of black shoes my wife has. She has different outfits. I didn't realize they have different colors. Like, I have one shoe and it goes with any outfit. She's got particular shoes for, it's news to me. I mean, all of these things, I just laugh, you know, I go to the beach, she loves the beach, and I have my umbrella because I burn walking out of our house. So I get the umbrella, I'm sitting at the beach, and I'm having fun, yep. You know, there's no sun on my body, except when I'm boogie boarding and out there. But it's just, that's kind of, oh, those are things she's loved. But on the other side, my wife has also taught me what compassion means like, what it means. She is a compassionate person. She cares for people deeply. She was one that encouraged in my life our consistency in life as believers, as parents, as friends. My wife is amazing at that, and as I've grown to love her, I've grown stronger in those same qualities. She sacrifices for others without much thought. That is what I, I gain from that relationship. Love brings loyalty, it builds it up, and so when we love God, it brings loyalty to him and his truth. Because if we love him, we're gonna love what he loves. And loving truth also means loving God's word. It's saying, I'm gonna love this as a gift from God. Psalm 119 says, I will speak of your statutes before kings, and I will not be put to shame, for I delight in your commands because I love them. I reach out for your commands, which I love that I may meditate on your decrees. Verse 159, see how I love your precepts. Preserve my life, Lord in accordance with your love. All your words are true and your righteous, all your righteous laws are eternal. What do we do with the world that's collapsing? What do we do with the world that's, that's just not making sense to us? The best thing you can do is to love God and love his word because you're gonna start looking more and more like him as you live out that reality. The second thing we're gonna challenge you to do is not just love the truth but to learn the truth to learn what the truth actually is. Jesus said as he was ascending back into heaven right before he left the earth, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Jesus said, I want you to dig into all the things that you have been commanded, which have been recorded for us right here. Near the end of Paul's life, he met with 
the elders from the town of Ephesus, he gathered together and he said, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. The whole will of God. When you and I are starting our faith journey, it really is smart, I believe, to focus on the Gospels, the story of Jesus. So if someone comes to faith, I will say, read the Gospel of John. It's the best place to start. And it's awesome and it's amazing. But I wanna encourage you as you kind of go through your spiritual life, don't get stuck in one genre of literature that we have for us. This entire book is from God. And so you could get what one of our friends, Eric Tonis, calls the red letter thing. We get stuck just reading the red letter of Jesus, which is really cool. And again, all God's word, all truth. But there's so much more that he wants us to discover. And at HDC, Pastor Brian and our growth team, along with a lot of other our team members, are desiring you to grow in your love and learning of the truth. And there's going to be opportunities more and more as we continue un- unpacking all of this. But please, go and learn the truth. Because as you learn it, you'll start doing the last L, and that is to live the truth. To live it out. If you love people, you're going to want them to meet the way and the truth and the life. Otherwise, you're simply unloving. And we have to live that out in very obvious ways to live it out in such a way that people see us and they see the truth of God reflected in our lives. To see us become more and more who God wants us to be. The world, and this is my contention, and I love study, so hear me out on this. The world um, doesn't want us to b- debate them more intelligently. I think the world needs us to love God and love his word and learn the word and live it out more passionately. I've never argued anyone to faith. I've never been able to say, let me communicate how you need to come to Christ and I argue them to the truth. There is truth in my conversations with people, but it is always linked to who they know I am. And if I don't live it out, my world will never believe what I say. That is the essence of our core value number one. Put it this way in your notes, truthful. Prepared world changers love the truth, learn the truth, and live the truth. That is at the essence of what we are all about. And I want to let you know, don't think we're pious. We fail. We are not perfect. We get things wrong. But that is what we're driving towards. That is our guiding principle. That are, those are the guardrails that keep us from going left or right. That is our DNA as a church. It's our first core value. I want to close our time with just a story from one of our own. Lindsay serves on our worship teams. She leads small groups. But I reached out to Lindsay and I said, Lindsay, why don't you share with us how your love for God's word impacts your daily life? So listen to her story. The truth of God's word has been an anchor for me in my daily life. As I've learned more about who God is and as I've grown in my relationship with Christ, I've learned to lean on truth above all else. The world and the people in my life will often tell me to lean on my feelings and allow my heart to guide me. But because of God's word, I know that my own feelings will often lead me astray and that my own heart can deceive me if I'm not following the truth of the Bible and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. How I feel in any particular moment or season in life can change in an instant. And the things the world will tell us to believe can change every day but God never changes, and his word is a firm foundation. So in my moments of anger, sadness, frustration, and even extreme happiness, I will remind myself that God created me in his image. He is in control and his plan is much greater than my own. 
He loves me and created a way for me to spend eternity with him by sending his son to pay the price for my sin. And he wants me to love him and love people the way he teaches us to through the Bible. I carry this truth with me at work, with my family, with the friendships that I build through small group, and in the quiet moments I spend alone. I thank God for his truth and the confidence that it gives me. I know I can trust what he says and I can lean on him no matter how heavy my load may seem. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. That is Lindsay's story. Um, I hope that can be your story as well. 